All right, all right. Grab your Bibles, grab your Bibles. Turn with me to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. We didn't finish your outlines last week, but I, I, I printed a whole new outline, it, which just included uh, the end that I didn't finish last week and a little bit of extra that I really wanted to get into last week, but we wasn't going to have room, so it, it's worked out uh, the way we want to do it, all right? Uh, good crowd tonight. My soul, good crowd tonight. Uh, here, here, if you're new on Wednesday night, we've been going through the book of Galatians. Uh, this is a letter uh, written to a region uh, where churches have been planted for, by the Apostle Paul. Uh, this wasn't a city, it was a region. If that makes sense, say amen. And these churches have been invaded by false teachers called Judaizers. They were coming in, Paul came and, and, and preached the gospel, uh, and he said, if you'll believe in Christ, if you'll put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And they got saved. They put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They got saved. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. God did miracles in their midst. Great things happened. And uh, listen, Paul went about his business. And then all of a sudden, here come these false teachers in and say, nope, nope, you're almost saved. You haven't completely done what you're supposed to do. You have to fulfill the law. You have to obey the Mosaic law too to be completely saved. It is faith. But you have to follow the law too. Well, Paul blows a gasket. I mean, they're just totally destroying salvation by faith. Amen? Which is the, and by the way, which is the only salvation there is. Okay? Uh, now, this letter is to defeat that and, and deal with those false teachers. The first two chapters is Paul's defense of himself in his apostleship and who he is uh, because they uh, declared that he was fake and he wasn't a real apostle. So he, he, he took care of that in the first two chapters. In the, the next two chapters, chapters 3 and 4, he is dealing with doctrine now. He goes into theological truth to give them. And this is, this is good. You say, why do we need all that? Well, here's why. Paul could have just said, all right, you're wrong, I'm right. He could have said, it's not by the law, uh, you are wrong, it's salvation is by faith through grace, right? By grace through faith, not of yourself, it is the gift of God. He could have said that, but, but then it would have been their word. That's why, now I'm going somewhere, might y'all just sound, y'all look tired, sit down. Because I don't know how long I'm talking before we get to the verses, see, I, you just go ahead and have a seat. I, listen. If, if you say you believe something and somebody says, why do you believe that? Don't say, because the preacher said so. Because that doesn't hold any weight. Paul is not saying this is the truth because I say so. Because he wanted them to have some ammunition in their gun, if you will. He wanted them to have some substance for their belief so that they could say, I believe such and such because, here we go. And so he brings in the scriptures, right? Well, the first thing we learned last week is just kind of review. This is in, the, in, in your notes here. Uh, the, first, the first thing we learned last week was he deals with some arguments. He does six different arguments, three in chapter 3 and three in chapter 4. And the first argument was a personal argument. He appeals to their personal experience. He says, don't you remember what happened? Don't you remember the message you heard of Christ? Don't you remember when I brought you right to the foot of bloody Calvary and you could almost feel like you were there? Don't you remember? Don't you remember when you received the Holy Spirit and the, the Spirit of God filled you and you saw the evidence of the Holy Spirit? And, and that was, you didn't follow the law to do that. That was before these Judaizers ever came. Don't you remember? Then he said, don't you remember the miracles that God did? Don't you remember the things, the supernatural things that God did in your midst before those false teachers came, before that you tried to follow the law? All of those personal experiences came by faith. So he has a personal argument. Then he moves to the scriptural argument. That's verses 6 through 14. 6 through 14. 
and he begins to take them back to Old Testament scriptures and show them how that, it, it's really cool because he, he looks at and he quotes Moses first. He quotes Moses first and said that God justified Abraham because he believed. He, he accounted him righteous. He put righteousness on his account, meaning this, meaning this, that he declared him right in a right standing with God. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Now remember this, remember this. The Bible says, for all have sin, for there is none righteous, no, not one. Meaning there's nobody right with God. Everybody is going to hell. Everybody. Everybody's under the curse of the law. And we have to be declared righteous. In order to go to heaven, we have to be righteous, meaning right with God, right standing with God. And nobody's righteous. We're all sinners. We're all doomed. And you say, well, I'm just going to be good. Only problem with that is, is the best you can do, the best you can do, according to Scripture, is as filthy rags in God's eyes. We're in trouble. So what does God say? Believe. It said, by faith, Moses was accounted righteous. God said, if you believe me, and I'm going to read it here in just a minute. You believe me, I'm going I'm to make you, I'm going to declare. Say that word with me. Declare. He didn't make you, he declared you. There's a big difference. The big difference. You say, well, what do you mean he didn't make me? Uh, uh, have, have you been in traffic after you're saved? I learned I'm not real righteous in traffic. But in God's eyes, in God's eyes, since I believed in Christ and put my faith in Christ, I've been declared righteous. I've been declared perfectly righteous. I have a righteous standing with God. Now, God's working on me. When you get saved immediately with your record in heaven, God declares you righteous, and then he begins to work on you here on this earth. That is called sanctification. What happens immediately is justification. I have been justified, justified, never sinned, declared to be righteous in the, in the, in the record books in heaven, but then a process of sanctification begins to take place here on this earth where God starts cleaning me up, getting stuff out of me, putting stuff into me, making me more like his son, Jesus Christ. If that makes sense, say amen. Now, he says this happened to Abraham. This was hundreds of years before the law. So before the law, you were saved by, by faith. Come on now. I just spoke 10 minutes on that, all right? Before the law. Before the law, you're saved by, by faith. All right? You're declared righteous. That means saved. You're put in the right standing with God. Then he quotes Habakkuk. Then he quotes Habakkuk in verse, let's see. In verse number 14, let me make sure. Verse number 11, eyes really help. Amen. He says, but no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the, now he quotes Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. All right, watch this. Before the law, you got saved by? Habakkuk is way after the law. He says you saved by? By faith. So before the law, it was faith. After the law, it was faith. Say amen. amen. Now, so he, he is using the scripture to defend his position. Now, now we look at the third argument. We look at the third argument. This is where we left off last week. And, uh, and, and so let's start there. But let's go back. Let's go back to verse number six. Let's go back to verse number six, and, and we'll come back and talk about the logical argument, all right? Verse number six, when you're there, say amen. amen. Even as Abraham believed God, he had faith. He believed God and it was accounted to him. That means it was put on his account. He was righteous. He was declared righteous in that moment, justified, saved. Know ye, therefore, that they which are of faith, that's me and you, when we put our faith in Christ, the same are the children of Abraham. You and I are spiritual children of Abraham by our faith, okay? And the scripture, foreseeing, 
that God would justify the heathen through faith. Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Brother Travis, I went to this after this morning and, and, and listened to Brother Buster Seaton's message on the gospel according to Abraham. Lord Jesus, I was shouting all over my office. Amen. And I may, I may rehash that for y'all, y'all guys one, maybe next Wednesday night. It was so good. Lord, have mercy. God showed him the gospel. Anyway, anyway. And squirrel, I did it again, Travis. Here we go. In thee, he's telling Abraham in that promise that we're going to read here in just a minute. In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now that is in reference to Christ. Okay, he's not talking about the nation as a whole blessing the world. He's talking about what was going to come through that nation who is Jesus Christ. Look, skip to, skip to verse, number, verse number 16 so I can support that argument. Look at verse 16. Now to Abraham and his plural or singular? Singular. singular where the promise, were the promises made, he saith not, and to seeds, plural, as of many. He's not talking about all the people. He said, what is he talking about? But as of one, and to thy seed, plural, singular, which is So when he looked at Abraham and said, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, he's talking about his great, 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 great grandson is going to come named Jesus. Are y'all with me? Say amen. This was a prophetic announcement, promised covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. If that makes sense, say amen. Now watch. So then, he's still in his scriptural argument. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. How is Abraham saved? By by faith. How are you saved? We're blessed the same way, right? Now watch. Verse 10. For as many as are of of the works of the law are under the... In other words, what he's saying, if you're trying to get to heaven by fulfilling the law, by doing good works, by accomplishing the law, he said, you're under a, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But he says, but that no man, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. You say, why not? Because no man can keep it. No man has had the ability to keep the law. They always break it. So it is impossible for a man to be justified by keeping the law, made right with God. So God made it where the just shall live by faith. Amen. And by the way, that's after the law. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. In other words, if you're going to get to heaven by the law, you have to completely fulfill the law perfectly, 100%. We can't do it, though. We can't do it. Christ hath redeemed us from the what? Curse Curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He went to Calvary. God put all of our sin all, watch this now. All of our inability to keep the law, every law we broke, God put it on his son, and his son paid for it. That the blessing, why did he do it? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That Now watch this. Here's a key word. Here's a key word. That we might receive the promise. Now, I want you to notice something. And by the way, did y'all notice y'all got color? There's a reason. I didn't, I didn't mess that up. There's a reason because I wanted to stand out. That's you're seeing what I see every week. Uh, and there's a couple of things I wanted to really, really stand out. So I left it color for you. But do y'all notice the blue markings? Do y'all notice the blue markings in that Bible? That's every time you find the word promise in this chapter, promise or promises. Okay, that's a key word for tonight, all right? That we might receive the promises uh, or the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, now here we go. Are y'all ready for the third argument? Here's the logical argument. Brethren, 
I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, here's a good word, covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. In other words, we're talking about God's covenant. We're talking about a divine covenant, a holy covenant. But he says, even, this is a logical argument. Even man, when man comes together and they make a covenant, if, if Brother McKelvey and Brother Mickle got together and they're going to make an agreement on something and make a covenant, and they ratify that and confirm that covenant, they don't come afterward and start changing the rules of the covenant. Start changing the condition. No, no, no. It's already been confirmed. It's already been ratified. You cannot change. He says even human covenants don't do that. Are y'all with me? Amen. Now watch. Now watch. Let's keep reading. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds, plural. So he's not talking about the people as of many but as of one and of thy seed, which is Christ, Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance, the inheritance means salvation, deliverance, the blessing, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. not stipulation. That's the point he's trying to make. And I'll get to that in a minute when we get back to the front page. Wherefore, let, let's stop right there. Let's stop right there and go to the front page. All right, we're going to talk about covenant of promise. The covenant of promise. Because you need to understand the significance of that before we go into uh, the, the, the relationship between uh, the covenant of promise and the, re the relationship of law and but where grace and law come together here, okay? So look on the front of your page. Look on the front of your page. When you get there, say amen. amen. Promise. Promise. A pledge to do something, a pledge to do something that obligates the pledger to follow through. Now let's look, let's look. And we're going, to do some, we're going to do some flipping in our book tonight, all right? Our Bible. Uh, Genesis 12, 2. This is the first instance that we find. This is when God tells Abraham to get up and get out of his country and go to where he's going to tell him. Genesis 12, 2. And, okay now, y'all help me. I, I got y'all blue and bolded and underlined. Okay, so I need you to be bold right here. You ready? And. Make of thee a great nation, and bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee. This is what God said he's going to do. He will. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, we already know, because we've talked about it already, what's he talking about, or who is he talking about right there? Jesus that he is promising salvation, all right? He's promising Jesus right here, okay? Now watch. Re let's go to Genesis 15. I didn't have, I didn't have place in your notes, so y'all going to have to work tonight, all right? It's good for you. Exercise. If you got your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, why don't you? <laughs> this, is, this is Bible study. Get your Bible, amen. Get your Bible. Genesis 15. See, y'all don't know if I'm telling you the truth. I might be reading out a Reader's Digest up here. <laughs> Get your Bible. Bring your Bible. All right? Y'all ready? Here's Genesis 15, 1. <clears throat> After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield, thy exceeding great reward. Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house, because see, he's done promising him a great nation that he's going to have a bunch of offspring, but he don't have none. He is childless, right? He said, the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine, thy own bowels shall be thine heir. Now, keep in mind, he's an old man right here, okay? 
And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Imagine that. Imagine this old man, old beyond having children, man. Are y'all with me? He's old. All right. God says, you're going to have so many grandchildren. It's insane. Just look at them stars up there. Look, that's what it's going to be like. That's what your offspring's going to be like. What? But watch what, watch what it says. Watch what it says. Verse 6, and he, Abraham, and he in the Lord. So what God do? He counted it to him for in that moment he declared him righteous because of his faith. Now watch. Now watch. Uh, now he says, okay, Lord, verse 8, how are we going to know this is going to happen? I need some, <laughs> I need some assurance. So God says this is what I want you to do. He said in verse 9, this is good now. You're going to learn something about covenant. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So here you have these animals. And he took unto him all of these and divided them in the midst. Now, it didn't mean he put the birds on this side and the, and, 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 and the heifer on this side. No, no, he cut them up. It was a sacrifice. When, when two people made a covenant in that day, they would both bring a lamb or a, or a, or a cow or whatever it is, and they would, they would half that and cut it in pieces, and they would lay it on the ground, and the two people making the agreement, the covenant, would walk in the midst of them, and you say, what was the point? It was as if saying, let happen to me what happened to these animals if I break this covenant. How many people does it take to make a covenant? Two, how many people has to walk in amongst the, the pieces? How many people have to keep the agreement? Keep that in mind. Watch this. He has cut them up. He has laid them out. He's ready to make this covenant. <clears throat> in verse 10, and he took unto him all of these, divided them in the midst, laid each piece one against another, and was this half of the cow on this side, this half of the cow on that side, and so forth and so on with the other animals. And when the fowls came, buzzards came, buzzards came. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now watch what God does. Watch what God does. Abram's ready to make this covenant. Abram's ready to make this agreement. Abram's ready to walk between the pieces. And when the sun was going down, a deep, help me, a deep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. So here he is in an unconscious state, in a deep sleep, in a darkness. Are y'all with me? All right, now watch. And he said, this is God. God's declaring again the covenant. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, talking about Egypt, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, Egypt, will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with a great substance. And they did. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, all them heathen people in Canaan's land, in the promised land, where God told Abraham, I'm going to give you all this land, they, all of their sinning wasn't full yet. In other words, the mercy of God, the mercy of God was allowing them time to repent until they got to a certain place. But when they got to a certain place, his mercy was over, and he brought his children out of Egypt to take over the land. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Now that's, that's what he said. This is the promise. This is the promise. Now watch. Now watch. Oh yeah, this is going to get good right here. Watch this. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, they're in the dark. Y'all with me? Amen. They're in the dark. This is important. This is important. They're in the dark. Uh, Abraham is unconscious. Abraham can do nothing. 
And so what's God do? God shows up, and that, now I'm going to see how many of y'all remember a couple Sundays ago, in a theophany. The presence of God manifests himself in this burning torch. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, they are in darkness, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with You say, how did he make a covenant with Abraham and he's sleeping? He's unconscious. Y'all getting it? Because he said, I will. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. I will bless all the nations of the earth. In other words, it wasn't based on Abraham. Abraham had nothing to do with it. It was all on God. There was no stipulations. It was a covenant of promise. Say that with me. It was a covenant of promise. I'm going to do all this stuff. Now, you see, the covenant of the law, was it was not a covenant of promise. It was based on performance. That covenant was if you, hello, it was based on performance. That's why it doesn't work. Amen. Watch this now. This is so good. I'm telling you. I'm going to buy my own CD today. Amen. Watch this now. Watch this. In that moment, he confirmed. In that moment, he ratified the covenant. Watch this now. All by himself. God did it all by himself. Now flip over to 17. Flip over to 17. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. We're running out of time. Genesis 17, 1. Now, now, now Abram's on up there. Now he's 90 years old and 9. 99. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I will, say it with me, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceeding. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. What covenant? The covenant he made earlier. The covenant he ratified in the darkness. Are y'all with me? Now watch this. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and make thee exceeding fruitful, and make nations of thee, and the king shall come out of thee, and establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations. Here it is. Here's the key. For an and everybody, everybody, and everlasting covenant. How long is the everlasting covenant? Forever. It's eternal. All right? And to thy seed after thee. Now watch what it says in verse 19. Watch what it says in verse 19. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and establish my covenant with him for an and with his seed after him. Are y'all seeing a, are y'all seeing a theme here? Now watch this. Now turn to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. This is right after. This is right after Abraham takes. This is right after Abraham takes his son Isaac up onto that hill of Mount Moriah, by the way. The same place that Jesus was sacrificed, by the way. All right? And, and he offers him, and God gives the substitute of the ram. I'm going to assume you know that story. Please tell me you do. Okay, if you don't, go read the chapter. All right, now look in verse number 16. <clears throat> and he said, by... Come on now. And he said, Have I sworn, saith the Lord, 
For because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing, bless thee. In multiplying, multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in thy seed, in thy seed, here we go, here we go. This is what he talked about in Galatians chapter 3. In thy seed, singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. He promised Jesus. You say, why did you read all these verses? Because you need to understand the covenant of salvation is an everlasting covenant of promise that came before the law. That's important. And I, there's two more. There's two more. Look in your notes. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Then you have the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. You say, what is that? That's when he promised David that somebody from his line would sit on that throne forever, still reverencing Jesus. 2 Samuel 7, 12, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Here's a key, people. Blue and bold. Are y'all with me? All right. He's telling David, when you sleep with your fathers, set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I miss one. I miss one. Oh, circle it, circle it, underline it. If you got blue, blew it. Oh, I can't believe I missed one. All right. I will establish his kingdom, and thine house, speaking to David, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established, how long? Before thee. Thy throne shall be established, how long? Forever. He's talking about in Christ. All right? Jesus is going to sit on that throne. I'm going somewhere. I know y'all. some of y'all getting bored. I got to set the table. All right? So just it, we're going somewhere. Isaiah 55, 3. Isaiah 55, 3. This is talking about the same Davidic covenant. Incline your ear, come unto me, here and your soul shall live and make what kind of covenant? Everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Ezekiel 37, still referencing the Davidic covenant. David, my servant, shall be king over the... Now, when he says this, understand he's talking about Jesus. Okay, he's talking about Christ. Because you remember in the, in the New Testament when they cried out, uh, uh, Jesus, thou son of... David, have mercy on me. This is what he's saying. So it says, and David, my servant, meaning Christ, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They, ought, they shall also walk in my judgments, observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell, even they and their children, their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be prince forever. Moreover, Make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And place them, multiply them, will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. So we see in the Abrahamic covenant, God is promising Jesus. He's promising Jesus. In thy seed, singular, you remember what Galatians 3 said? He's talking about Jesus in thy seed. Talking about Jesus. Here in the Davidic covenant, he promises David that somebody's going to sit on his throne from his line, which will be Jesus. Jesus. All right? Y'all with me? Amen. And how long is the covenant? Amen. When will it end? Amen. Are y'all with me? Amen. Now watch now. Now we have the new covenant. This is the one you're most familiar with. This is the one that Jesus established when he got here. This, this cup. This cup, he said, is the New Testament. The word testament there means covenant. Is the new covenant that he is making. Are y'all with me? This is our covenant. All right, y'all with me? Here's the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that make a 
new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that they took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant, what'd they do? They broke it. That's the covenant of the law. Although I was a husband unto them, I was good to him, he says, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put uh, my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God. And they shall be my people. I love this part. Watch this. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin. Church, say amen. Jeremiah 32 is referencing the same new covenant. And he says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Now, what is the common denominator? Blue people. (laughs) What is the common denominator? God said he will. It's not based on our ability. It's not based on our performance. It's not based on us keeping the law. This is an everlasting covenant. This is a covenant of promise. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now watch this. Three things I want you to write down before we jump into, into points. What do we find from these covenants? They're divine. They're divine. This covenant is divine, meaning God alone. God alone. Who walked in the midst of those pieces? Alone. Did Abraham? No. They were. Now watch this now. Let me show you how this goes together. They were in a darkness. There was a sacrifice. And God alone alone made the covenant of promise. I will. Many years later, many years later, Jesus Christ climbed the same hill that Isaac climbed. And he died on an old rugged cross. And several hours during that time, they were incomplete because he was walking in between the sacrifice all by himself. He was making the covenant, the new covenant in his blood. You had no part in it. You had no place in it. It doesn't matter whether you can carry his cross or not. It doesn't matter whether you can keep his law or not. He was making it for you, and all you got to do is put your faith in him. God walked in between those pieces with Abraham all by himself, saying, Abraham, this is not dependent on you. This is not dependent on your ability. This is not dependent on what you bring to the table. I'm going to promise you this, and I'm going to fulfill it all by myself. Jesus Christ went into that darkness on that cross and said, it is not by my ability. It is not by what I bring to the table. It is not by anything I can do for him. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It's done. You don't have to do. Boy, say amen. It's an eternal promise. It's an eternal promise. It's a a divine promise, meaning God alone. It's an eternal promise, meaning it's irrevocable. Say it with me. It's It's irrevocable. You can't change it. You can't change it. Number three, it's gracious. Say, what is this covenant? It's undeserved and unconditional. It's undeserved and unconditional. So, 
You have permission to flip your paper. <laughs> now watch. Now you're, now you're going to know why we went through all of that. So well, we just was all over the place. Not really. We wasn't really all over the place. We went from one covenant to the next, and all three of them had to do with our salvation. And it started with Abraham. And Paul is saying that, look, Abraham was saved by faith. It's always been faith. Salvation has always been by faith. It was faith before the law. He quoted Habakkuk. It was faith after the law. Are you all with me? Amen. So what, what, do we, what do we need to know from that? Verse 15. You ready? Amen. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's, but a man's covenant, yet if it be, confirmed. once it's confirmed, once they walk in between them pieces and they make that agreement, once it's confirmed, no man, what? Disannul. They don't disannul it. They don't do away with it or. Y'all with me? Yeah. He said, even in a man's covenant. You say, but what, what, what? God made the promise. God made the promise. So what? A, write this down. Write this down. When the law came, the promise came with Abraham. All right? The promise came with Abraham. The law came with Moses. But keep this in mind. A, the law cannot change the promise. He's saying you cannot change and disannul the promise that God made in the darkness in that covenant. Are y'all with me? Amen. It cannot change it. It's an, it. What kind of covenant it is? Everlasting. It's everlasting. It's a covenant of promise. It's not based on conditions. It's based on God's will. Are y'all with me? Amen. The law cannot change the promise. He says now, to Abraham and his seed were the, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as in plural, as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. He's reverencing Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after. In other words, God confirmed it with Abraham. Yep. Now, keep in mind this 430 years was not 400 years from Abraham. It was 400 years from the time he gave the promise to Jacob. Yes. Okay? He told Abraham. He, he reiterated it with uh, Isaac, and he reminded Jacob after that last confirmation of the promise. Then 430 years later, here comes the law. He said, look, the, the promise... And the covenant, which is an everlasting covenant, it's an eternal covenant where God said, not you, not performance, not based on your, your obedience or your behavior. He said, this is something I'm going to do. He said, this law came 430 years after. All right. Now watch. It came 430 years after. Watch it. Read it with me. Cannot, read it with me, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of. The promise is still the promise. The promise is still the promise regardless, regardless of the law. For if the inheritance, that means that promise of salvation, of being declared righteous. If the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of. Did y'all see that? But God gave it to Abraham by promise. When he looked at Moses and said the law to Moses, if you do this, in other words, based on your performance, based on your ability, based on your actions, that's the law. And guess what? None of them could. But to Abraham, he just said, Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? 
your salvation, your inheritance, your blessing is solely based on God. On his covenant. The law can't change that. It's what Paul is teaching. Verse 19, I know what you're thinking. Then why did he give it? Why did we have the law? He, you know, Paul, he, 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 he saw that question coming. Yeah. Verse 19, wherefore then serveth the law? What's the point? Why do we even have the law? It was added because of transgressions. Sin. Till the seed should come. You might have to adjust that, Brother Mike. I had to move it on my ear. Till the seed should come, that's talking about Jesus, to whom the promise was made. And it was, who was the promise made to? You sure? You sure? Let me, let me remind you what the promise is. In thee, Abraham, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So who's the promise to? All of us. All of us. I, had, I should have put that in blue. <laughs> Till the seed should come to whom? The promise was made. How many of y'all are glad God made a promise to you? He was going to send a deliverer, a Messiah, the seed. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator, this is talking about the law now. This is talking about the law. It was given till Christ came. It was given through the, through the agency of the angels. God met Moses on the mountain, and through angels he gave them the law. They had a mediator. All right? When you have a mediator, how many is in the, how many is in the, in the, in the room? Three. 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 Two making a covenant, one with the mediator, right? The mediator, are y'all with me? Yeah. But watch this. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. But guess what? When God made the covenant, it says, but God is... One. There was no mediator with him and Abraham. Why? Because God said, I'm going to do it all by myself. Say amen. amen. <laughs> yes. Is the law, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, for there is none, no, not, for all have and come short of that the promise, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that. Now, what does that mean? That means when God said, Abraham, this is what I'm going to do, and Abraham believed him. God said, I will. I will declare you righteous. In that moment, he was justified. He saved. And now, through Christ, if we put our faith in the Son of God, in Christ and his death on the cross, and we say, God, we believe, he says, I will. And in that moment, he declares, we become, watch this now, we become partakers of the same promise. Promise. David, or Abraham, I declare you righteous. I put on your account righteousness. Malcolm, when you believed, when you had faith, just like Abraham believed and had then you become part of the same promise that was made to Abraham. Now, I'm a child of Abraham. Say amen. Now, watch this. By faith, by faith. Now, watch. 
A, the law cannot change the promise. B, the law is not greater than the promise. The promise is greater than the law. You say, why is the law not greater than the promise? Now, now keep in mind, I mean, we're, we're, you got to understand how much these Judaizers and the Jewish people revered the law. I mean, they just, they, you might as well say they worshiped the law. And God, is, and God, through Paul, is teaching them, look, the promise is better than the law. The promise is greater than the law. You say, why? Because the law, watch this now, look at everybody. The law was temporary. The promise was everlasting. Y'all with me? The promise was everlasting. The law was temporary. Secondly, the law required a mediator. We learned that in verse 19. But with the promise, God did it all by himself. See, not only is the law cannot change the promise, it's everlasting. The law is not greater than the promise. See, the law is not contrary to the promise. They're not at odds. They're not at odds. They're not fighting. They're not enemies. The law is not the enemy to the promise. And if you think it is, you misunderstand the purpose of the law, which he's going to share with us. Look what it says. Verse 23, when you're there, say amen. amen. He says, well, let's back up. Let's back up 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Are they fighting? Are they, are they at odds? No, no, God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. You see, the law is not contrary to the promise. We need to understand two or three things here. Number one, the law was not given to provide life. God never gave the law to save you. You say, why didn't God give us the law to save us? Because he knew you couldn't keep it. That would have been a futile exercise. There's never been a law. Matter of fact, it's in, it's in another, another book of the Bible, but you'll learn that the law doesn't, it doesn't make you holier. Matter of fact, it excites sin in you. The law triggers. So how do you, here's a perfect illustration. You walk, by, you walk by a park bench. It says, do not touch wet paint. What are you fixing to do? <laughs> Why? Because the law just stirred up. Watch this now. This is important that you see this. The law just stirred up your sinful nature. Yeah. The law says 65 miles an hour. What are you doing? 70. 70. Don't step on the grass. Because the law, it does. I mean, Paul teaches this. There's never been a law that causes you to quit sinning. Are y'all with me? There's never been a law that creates life or determines righteousness. But watch, but watch. This is key. This is key. You got you to get this. Verse, verse let's see. Verse 19a, verse 19a says, Wherefore then serveth the law? Why did he give it? Look at verse 22. But the scripture saith, He hath concluded all under sin. In other words, the law teaches us. The law teaches us that we are all, we're all under sin. So how do you know? How do you know? All right. Let's take a survey. How many of y'all have ever lied? If you don't have your hand up, you just did again. <laughs> now, the law says, the law says, thou shalt not lie. Bear false witness. 
Here's the thing. So we have just seen the power of the law. The law just showed us all that we are sinners. We're sinners. It's declared as the scriptures is the law. The scriptures have concluded all under sin. The, the scriptures have found out that we are all under sin. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Now watch what, watch what verse 24 teaches us, what, what the law does for us. You see, the law was given, it was not given to provide life. Number two, the law was given to reveal sin. To reveal sin. In other words, to show us we're sinners. To show us that we're sinners. It reveals sin. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed the closer you get to God and the more you dig in the Word, the law, how much sin you still have? And we just, oh my goodness. Man, I need to work on that area in my life. Man, I need to work on that area in my life. And the more it just reveals, reveals, Revealed. Then watch this. But good news, good news. You see, verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. What does the law do? To bring us unto that we might be what? By faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We don't need the law anymore. You see, watch this now. Here, here's, here, everybody look at me. We've got two minutes. What does the law do? Everybody look at me. This is important. When we read the scriptures and we read the law, and we see what it takes, because the law is God's perfect law. In other words, if you're going to be right with God, you have to, you have, to have been completely, perfectly obedient to this, this law. Are y'all with me? Not some bits, not some pieces, all of it. James says if you break one, you're a lawbreaker. Are y'all with me? Now watch. What does the law do? It shows us how much of a sinner we truly are. And what does the law do? It breaks us down. What does the law do? If you study it and you read it and you really open your mind and your heart to it, it makes you feel Hopeless. It makes you feel guilty. It may it puts you, here's the spiritual term. It puts you under deep Holy Ghost conviction. And you understand your hopeless state. You understand you're helpless before God. You are unrighteous. You, 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 you start feeling like the writer of amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved an old wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. The law will show you your wretchedness and cause you to run to Jesus. The law wasn't there to save you. It was to cause you to run to Jesus. It's like the cold air in the winter. It'll make you run to the fireplace and get warm when you find out how low down and wicked and sinful you truly are and, oh, how wretched our heart is. It'll make us run to Jesus and plead for mercy. That's the whole point. He gave us the law to teach it to, listen, lead us to Jesus. And so once we get to Jesus, we don't need it no more. Now don't get you, don't 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 get all jacked up thinking. So what's God do then? He takes that law and he stuffs it in your heart. And now you obey not because you're compelled to, not because you're trying to stay safe, but you obey because you recognize that God's grace has been merciful to you, and he saved your old wretched soul, and you love Jesus so much, you just want to please him and, and just make him happy and say, God, I want to be obedient unto you. Are y'all with me? Say amen. 
Yeah, it's just a schoolmaster. The law was given to prepare the way for Christ. You see, we won't never go to the doctor unless we really think we're sick. You know what I found? You know what I found with people, especially in the South, especially in, in the Bible Belt, is it, it, it's not hard getting people saved. It's hard getting people lost. And you know what? You can't get them saved till you get them lost. Because people that have a church background, and maybe their papa went to church, and they have some kind of church familiarity, or maybe they've attended church all their life. They think they're good. But you hit them over the head with the law. You let the law, the word of God, that sharp two-edged sword cut into, listen, as deep as the marrow of the bone and cut to the heart of the matter, and they will see themselves as a wretched sinner. And they'll understand, I'm lost. The law is very important. And the law is necessary. But it's like Paul told Timothy, the law is for outlaws. That's what he said, read it. He said the law is for the lawless. You use the law to show people how much they need Christ. It's to lead them to Christ. D, here, we, let's finish. The law cannot do what the promises can do. Verse 27. Verse 27, here's what the promises do. Verse 26 says, for ye are all the children of God by the law. Is that what it says? No. No. For ye are all the children of God by in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. You say, what created that? The law. You see, the law separated. The law divided, but the promise put us together. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all, help me, ye are all in Christ Jesus. And <laughs> I like this. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I don't know about y'all. But thank God for the promise. Can we give God praise and glory? Give him praise. No, for real, give him praise. Give him praise. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. Thank God. Thank God for an everlasting covenant of promise. Now, there's two words. There's two words. If y'all do this, I'm going to make you sit down and I'm going to preach for another hour. There's two words I want y'all to go home with. Come on. If you put your faith in him, he said, I will. I will. Amen. That's good stuff. Well, that's all. <laughs> Let me see. My, I thought they gave me 23, 23 more minutes, but uh, it's, I think they just flipped the clock on me. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, man, y'all pray for Sunday. Pray for Sunday. We're going to be back in Mark 7, and uh, we're going to talk about the heart. Oh, my goodness. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get real Sunday. Y'all bring some friends with you. Oh, he said Paul, or not Paul, excuse me, Jesus Told, told them disciples, said, look, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out your mouth. Right. See, what goes in your mouth can't get into your heart. Right. But what is in your heart can get out. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's going to be good. Yes, yes. Let's pray. Let's pray.